where do I start? I, um, I'll, I'll tell you what this uh, website is all about later. I presented this within a couple of different KC-135s. It's going to be very attractive. Uh, I've never given a talk in here before. All right, so I've given this talk in a couple of different forms. I gave it at the uh, uh, Society of Experimental Test Pilots Symposium a few months ago, and I've given it to my MyEA chapter. I'm from uh, Washington State, Seattle. Um, so each time I give this talk, I kind of I kind of spin it a little bit differently. So I, when I give it to test pilots, it's a little bit more focused on test flying, and when I you know I even give it to, to people who are Boeing engineers, and it's more from a you know, airplane design and performance point of view. Uh, and then when I give it to EAA, uh, I try to talk about home builds, on the future airplane building, and so on. But the, the more generic way to think about the talk is is the physics of aerobatics. So what I what I try to do is set up aerobatics as, as a Newtonian-like high school physics problem that most of us can think about without a lot of, a lot of other math. Um, so I'll, I'll start with disclaimers. I'll start by, well, my name is Bernardo Altatone, first of all. So my, uh, my day job is I'm a structural engineer at Boeing, uh, but I have an RV6 and enjoy flying aerobatics. I hope to build an airplane uh, very soon, which I have plans for. And, you know, like, like most of you guys, I've been airplane deep all my life. Been going to air shows and watching aerobatics since I was a little kid. It's always, always fascinating. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not an FAA certified instructor or, or a test pilot, so I'm not a, a professional in, in the topic that I'm about to discuss. Um, but what I am good at is teaching, you know, I teach a lot on the side. Um, and what I, what I think I am good at is taking things that are relatively complicated and bringing the, the physics and the math down to kind of a high school level so you can really understand it and do things with it and think about it. Um, so I, I'm going to keep this at a high school level, so it's for students and people who are not engineers, you know, and EAA members. So you know, I don't want to ask anyone to do any math or anything like that. And then finally, what I'm going to talk about is what is physically possible. You know, not I'm not about not what's legal or, or safe or advisable or a good idea. So you know, don't necessarily try this at home. Uh, but uh, you know, this is, this is what airplanes would be capable of if you if you wanted to do certain things. And towards the end, I'll start talking about things like, um, you know, how much margin do you have to do certain maneuvers in certain airplanes? You know, this airplane could do a loop, but only if you do it perfectly right. If you mess up just a little bit, it will fall out of the sky or something like that. So, so I'll, I'll start to quantify things at the end, not just in terms of could the airplane do it, but could it do it safely without killing you versus only if you're a check you know? Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to bring this All right. So, like I said, on the on the side, in addition to work, I teach a class about airplane design and airplane performance, and I teach it to to mom engineers, and I've taught it to high schoolers, and I teach it to, I teach it at Boeing because there's a lot of people at Boeing who are, you know, lawyers or accountants or communications professionals or you name it. We're not who are not airplane people. It's really the bottom line. There's even a lot of engineers at Boeing who are not airplane people. Right? I'm a structural engineer. I work with civil engineers and material scientists, and they don't know. What, flat on the alarm, right? So I created this, this eight-hour class, which is based on airplanes one on um, And so I teach this class to people who are not airplanes. Here's how airplanes work, here's how things make live, here's how, you know, this engine works, here's how gen engine works, and here's a little bit of aviation history, here's kind of drag, and here's why these airplanes have these kinds of things, you know, here's how you calculate performance, and so on. Um, and at the end of the class, uh, people would always ask, so, you know, could a 747 do a roll? Or, or could a 172 do a loop? Uh, or, or things like that. And I started thinking, mm, you know, maybe, probably, I guess, I don't know. Uh, and as I, as I thought about it, and I, I, I tried to, try to find the right answer, what I found is that, you know, there are a lot of books out there with a lot of equations and graphs and things about how to think about airplane performance, right? If you have an airplane of a certain weight, with so much horsepower, with so much wing area, and so much wingspan, you're going to need a certain amount of runway to get off the ground, and you're going to be able to climb a certain angle and a certain speed, and if you're going to make a turn, if you're going to get this much, the radius will be this much, it will so many Gs, right? There's a lot of equations in, in textbooks out there about airplane performance and airplane design. Uh, but when it comes to aerobatics, there aren't really, right? There, there isn't the, the rigorous treatment of you know, what you need to be able to do a loop or a roll, or what airplane characteristics will allow what maneuvers. This is what the same way there is for normal performance, for takeoff and landing distances, for climb angle and rate, and for cruise performance and payload, and payload range, things like that. So I thought, okay, let me, let me try to sit down and think through the physics problem and then come up with some, some equations and some graphs and some way to think about how to predict the aerobatic behavior of an airplane given its characteristics. The same way that you have equations to predict again, range, speed, climb, rate, and so on. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I started out doing. 
Um, and usually here I'll just start talking about how you set up the, how you think about the physics of aerobatics, but I'm just going to give you a spoiler and say, here's what we're working towards. So in, you know, in half an hour or 40 minutes, what we'll, what we'll get to is are these charts. And the chart on the left is, on the, on the y-axis is, you know, given an airplane, on the y-axis is um, basically how fast you're willing to go. Um, and that can mean different things. It can be E and E. It can be what you're personally comfortable with, or whatever. Like how, you know, how fast you're willing to go. And on the y-axis is how long it takes the airplane to roll 360 degrees. And if you, if you don't want to go find out, you know, you can roll your airplane from, uh, you know, from 90, you know, 90 degrees to the left, rolling 90 degrees to the right, that's 180 degrees. It'll take you twice that long to go 360. Uh, so here's how long it takes to roll 360, and here's how fast you're going to go at the beginning of the roll. And basically, if you're on the, on the green side of the line, you'd probably be safe to do a roll. And if you're on the red, you'd probably lose. So whether or not an airplane can do a roll, it only matters basically how fast it can go and how long it takes to, to roll it around. And I'll, you know, we'll, I'll spend some time describing how I got here and what it means and so on. And then for a loop, I created the, the, the chart on the right. And this is kind of weird, but I'll tell you how I got there. Um, this is how many Gs you can pull on the Y axis. Typically, that's a you know, structural limitation on how many Gs your, your wing structure can take. Uh, and on the X axis, it's the ratio between the maximum speed, so how fast you're going to go, and the stall speed. Uh, and you know, some airplanes can barely go twice their stall speed. Some airplanes can go five times their stall speed. Uh, it really depends. It. And that actually turns out to be the, the main uh, parameter to whether an airplane can do a loop or not. Airplanes that can do three, four, five times their stall speed, they can do a loop without even pulling 2G. Uh, it's airplanes that struggle to go two or three times their stall speed that really need to pull a lot of Gs to, to be able to get all the way around. And I'll show you how I got there. But just to tell you, what we're going to work towards is an understanding of of these graphs. So if you know how fast you're going to go and how long it takes to roll around, you can decide whether or not it's a good idea to, to do a roll. Right? If you're right here on the orange line, you know, have a try it. Uh, and same thing for a loop. If you know the ratio of how fast you're going to go and the salt speed, and you know how many Gs your structure can take, you can decide you know, where you're on the graph. You know, I think I should mention, uh, before I get any further, that when I started teaching that class of airplane design and airplane performance for, for non-engineers, I started putting all of my materials on understandingairplanes.com. So if you go to understandingairplanes.com, there's a little resources button that has all my slides. You can download all the slides for the class, you can download all these slides. Uh, so don't feel like you need to take notes or take pictures. I mean, you can if you want, but I'm just saying you can just go there and download uh, this if you want to. And, and soon there will be a video, uh, hopefully. All right, uh, so how did I get here? So let's talk about roles. So for, for those of you who aren't used to thinking about the, the physics of the aerobatics and what different roles are, so I'll start off by saying that there's basically three different kinds of rolls. Uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with aerobatics, you know about this. There is a slow roll, an aileron roll, and a barrel roll, and different people call these slightly different things, but for the purposes of this little talk here, so the slow roll is where the airplane flies in a straight line and, and rolls you know, without really gaining or losing altitude. Right? So during a slow roll, you go from level flight to knife edge flight one way, to minus 1G flight, so you're hanging from the straps, to knife edge flight the other way, to uh, level flight. So you have to be able to take the negative Gs and, and you know, fly side, fly side and so on. Um, an aileron roll is roughly a zero G maneuver. An aileron roll is kind of like a zero G pushover, right? So the air, like a vomit kind of maneuver. The airplane pulls up and then it does a zero G ballistic parabola and then it pulls up again back to level flight. So during the, the, the time when the airplane is rolling, the wings aren't actually generating lift. The airplane is falling off the bridge, right? Like the that's the easiest one to do, so I'll talk about that one. Because if an airplane can do, you know, if, if an airplane can do any kind of roll, it'll be, it'll be that one. And I'll, I'll tell you about it. And then a barrel roll is one where the airplane, you know, follows the inner, you know, wall of the cylinder, if you can imagine. So it has a little bit of a loop to it. And then that one keeps the positive, po positive Gs the whole time. So if you do a barrel roll, your butt's much like it's a seat uh, the whole time. So let's talk about the aileron roll. So again, like I said, how does the aileron roll go? The airplane starts in level flight, and if you need to dive to pick up a little bit of speed, you can, but at some point you can level flight. And then you're going to pull into a climb, and you're going to push the airplane into a zero G ballistic parabola. Right? You're going to push the airplane to the same path through the air that a cannonball going at that speed and angle would, would take. Uh, and during that zero G arc is where the airplane rolls. And then when you get to the end, you know, you're, so you start off facing upwards, right? And then you do your roll, and then by the end of your roll, your nose is probably below the horizon. So you pull the nose up again. Uh, so during the time that the airplane rolls when it's in 3G. 
And then again, you know, starting to get a little bit into the Newtonian physics. You know, I'm not going to go into deep into this, but just to just bring some of that high school physics back. The velocity of the airplane, right, the vector, the arrow of, of where the airplane is going through the air, has a vertical component and a horizontal component. Right? If the airplane is going through the air in this direction, there's the, you know, if you imagine like a diagonal line, there's a vertical component with that diagonal line and a horizontal component with that diagonal line. Uh, and the way that projectile motion works, the way it's modeled, is that the vertical component uh, decreases steadily over time because of gravity. So you start out with some upwards vertical component. At the top of the arc, there's no vertical component. You're basically going horizontally. And then at the bottom of the arc, there's a downwards vertical component. Right? So the vertical component of the speed is what gravity eats away at at every moment. So it goes from upwards to horizontal to downwards. And the horizontal component, the yellow line, stays the same all the way through. So as the airplane goes up and down, how many miles, you know, the speed over the ground, so to speak, stays, stays the same. So if you were to look at an airplane doing a ballistic aileron roll from the back, it would be the same as, as a, a ball being tossed up and down like that. Right? Well, look, it'll stop and fall back down. If you were to watch the airplane doing this maneuver from above, it would just be moving steadily over the ground. Does that make sense? And the, the, the reason I'm reminding you of all this is that we're pretty, pretty soon what we're going to worry about is how long do I have to do this? How much zero G time do I get? And how much zero G time you get depends on, on that vertical component. It depends on that green arrow. It depends on how much up velocity you have at the beginning of the movement. Because it's that up velocity that gravity is going to eat away at during every moment, and that's going to tell you how much, you know, how long you have to, to do this. Uh, so that's really the question: how much time is zero G? So if you manage, so here's the what to use half of the bottom comments, that's a DC9. Uh, so if you have some velocity at that angle, again, there's some vertical component, there's some horizontal component, and if, you, if the airplane goes to zero G, or if you imagine if the airplane dropped a bomb or something, right, how long would that have until it's the same altitude that any downwards? And if you, you know, if you remember your, your vectors and your Newtonian uh, physics, the vertical component of the velocity is the velocity times the sine of the angle of climb. So you know, that means if you're going horizontally, the sine is zero. If you're going straight up, the sine is one. So it's the whole velocity. Somewhere in between, it's going to be somewhere between zero and one. Uh, so, for example, if you're climbing at 30 degrees, the sine of that is half. So, if you're climbing at 30 degrees, the vertical component of the velocity is, is half the velocity of the airplane. Uh, so, that's, your, that's how big that vertical arrow is. Then, yeah. okay, how much time at zero g does that buy me? That's the vertical component divided by g, because again, gravity is eating away at that at every second, uh, times two, because it's going to go from some positive value to zero and then to that negative value. So you have twice, you know, gravity is going to take that to zero, and then you have twice that long because you're going to be heading downwards, right? Um, and that's enough for you to plug some numbers in there. Uh, and if you plug some numbers in there, oh, what if I go at this speed? Oh, what if I pull up at this angle? You play around with these, with these equations a little bit, and what you find is that if you're willing to pitch up 30 degrees, and 30 degrees is, you know, reasonable, it's kind of steep, it's steeper than most people do, but it's not as steep as the sea that the arrow bats are out there. So let's just say 30 degrees as a reasonable angle. For 30 degrees, for every 100 knots, you get 5 seconds, is what comes out of your equation. If you plug 100 knots and 30 degrees into these equations, you get 5 seconds of zero G. If you plug in 200 knots and 30 degrees into these equations, you get 10 seconds. If you plug in 500 knots, like a jetliner, you get uh, 25 seconds, which is about what the, the wrong amount gets. Uh, so, so that's how much time zero G you have. And now, if, if going back to what we're talking about here, which is given an airplane, can I roll this airplane? Is it a good idea to roll this airplane? Well, this is how much time zero G you have if you do a ballistic properly. So you really shouldldn't be able to roll within that time. How long does it take to roll your airplane all the way around? If, if your airplane can go 200 knots, can you roll it in 10 seconds? If you can, or if you feel very good, oh yeah, I can roll much less than 10 seconds. Then, you know, maybe we have a try. Um, Well, then again, zero G, right? Yeah, zero G. Right. So you have to roll all the way around. At the end of this maneuver, you're heading downwards, and you need to do a pull-up and get back to horizontal. So you need to be 360 all the way around. Uh, all right. So how do you find out your roll rate? Again, like I said, uh, you, you don't want to just go out and find out. But it's not that hard to you know go flying and make the airplane 90 degrees that way, and then pull the flexion the other way, see how long it takes to go from 90 degrees bank to the left to 90 degrees and to the right. That's how long it takes to roll 180. It's going to take twice that long to roll 360. Uh, 
So that's all it takes, and then you can say, well, for, for my speed, do I have time for the airplane? Again, yeah, yeah, the entry speed, for, from the, for the purposes of what's the safest way to do this, what if my airplane can barely do it, how do I, you know, how I find out where that limit is, you know, you basically want the entry speed to be as fast as you're willing to go. Uh, and that could mean V and E, except if you do this and you, and you botch it near the end, you end up going downwards longer than you expected, you might exceed the speed you started off with. So you probably want to start off with, you know, a little bit further back than maybe uh, from the, you know, the maximum safe speed for the airplane, from the flutter speed of the airplane. Um, and and that, that's really it for, for can an airplane go roll? You know, how fast it goes and all it takes all the way around, then figure out how to roll it. You could, you know, sharpen your pencil a little bit, as we say in engineering, and say, oh, I want to do a more careful analysis. If you sharpen your pencil, some of the, the next things you'll probably think about are the facts that during the pull-up, you're going to lose a, a little bit of speed because there's more in drag at that higher angle attack on the EGs. Uh, and because just during that initial pull-up, you're going to gain a little bit of altitude, you're going to lose some kinetic energy to put potential energy. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but the impact of that is, is all very small. So if you really do a very careful analysis, thinking about induced drag, about how much the airplane goes up at the very beginning during the pull-up, uh, you're going to say, oh, it's not five seconds per hundred times. It's 4.5 seconds, or maybe more than that. So the impact is, is pretty small. So the general rule of five, five seconds per hundred knots is, is pretty good. Uh, and so again, here comes that graph. So if you're if your, your airplane can go as fast as 100 knots, and your airplane's going to go faster than that, then you need to be able to roll it in five seconds in, a, in order to be able to do a roll during the zero G. For sure. Okay, if your airplane can go 200 knots uh, without any risk of flutter or anything, then you have 10 seconds of zero G to roll it up. So basically, the faster you go, the easier it is to roll it up the way around. Um, and in practice, most, most airplanes can be rolled. I think we all watched uh, each 18 be rolled over the past couple days and, and a couple hours again. Uh, you, I'm sure you guys all heard about the, the 707 prototype and Dash 80 being rolled by, by Tex Johnson and Boeing in 1994. Uh, and uh, one, one interesting point about uh, and then, you know, if you go online, there are, there are videos of V-22s being rolled, the C-27s being rolled, with air jets. I've seen the air jets being rolled at air shows too. Uh, so, uh, Lou Wallach was one of the Boeing test pilots that did the test flights for the uh, 2737, 5767. So there's a core group of Boeing test pilots that test flew most of the, the seven jets uh, from the 60s to the 80s. And Lou, Lou Wallach was one. And his daughter, Rebecca Wallach, wrote this great book called Growing Up Boeing, where she interviews her dad and his friends about you know, test flying the, the Boeing jets in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And, and then, of course, she asked him, you know, what we all know about the 707 rule. Did, did you guys roll your airplanes? And they say, well, you know, we, we can't really say, but let's put it this way. And they tell the story. They say that at one point, um, a pilot from an airline came to Boeing and took delivery of their jet and flew the airplane back to you know, some other country. And when he arrived at this other country, he did a, a, a roll, an aileron roll, and landed the airplane and was fired. And he sued the airline, saying what I did was perfectly safe. I kept the airplane within the G limits, and then so forth. You should not have fired me for, for you know, negligence or whatever it was. Um, and so both the pilot's lawyers and the airline's lawyers speak to Boeing and said, you know, you have to tell us whether or not it's safe to roll this airplane. And so Boeing went to the test pilots and said, you know, you guys have to say whether or not it's safe to roll these airplanes. And all the test pilots refused. They, they would not be willing to stand up in court and, and take an oath and say that it, it is safe or it is not safe to roll the airplanes, right? So if they say it's safe, then that opens up a whole can of works. If they say it's not safe, well, then they might look into whether they've done it. So they just basically refuse. Uh, which kind of means that they all roll the airplanes. Uh, so very incorrectly, you kind of get at it. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about rolls. Before I move on to loops, are there any questions or, or thoughts? Share. Right. I mean, this obviously is very informal, so if anyone has any questions or stories or you know ideas, um, let me know. All right, so loops. The main problem with loops, you know, if I ask, can an airplane do a loop? The main challenge of the loop, what we're on is like um, for the roll, the main challenge is how it can take roll around the airplane, right? Some airplanes are pretty snappy. You can roll a, a light airplane around pretty fast. You know, it takes much longer to roll a 707 or a whatever airliner you want to try to roll a bit more sluggish. When it comes to loops, that's not really a problem. It, you know, all that the air needs to do is pull up and pull a certain amount of G's upwards. In. Most airplanes, if you're going fast enough, they'll pull that many G's if you just pull the stick. So it's not really a matter of airplane agility. Uh, it's a matter of kinetic energy, kinetic energy potential. 
you have to be going fast enough at the bottom, because you know, as you go up and up and up and up the loop, kinetic energy becomes potential energy. Kinetic energy becomes potential energy. And at the top, you have to have some kinetic energy left to make it on the top, otherwise you're going to fall the top. Um, so the main question for can an airplane do a loop is does it have enough kinetic energy at the bottom, and can it pull a tight enough loop? You know, the, the, the height of the loop depends on how, how tightly the airplane can turn, how many Gs it can pull, just from like a structural point of view. So if the airplane can pull a lot of Gs, you can keep the loop really tight. If the airplane cannot pull a lot of Gs, then the loop is going to be taller, uh, but then the airplane has to have more speed. So anyway, so, so those are the main, main things that really matter. How, how fast can the airplane go and how many Gs can, can safely be pulled in a structural way. Uh, and, and as you see, actually it's much more about the speed than about the Gs. And I'll, I'll explain why. Uh, so again, yeah, brief, you know, try to sneak in some, some Newtonian physics, you know, lessons in here. Brief reminder about kinetic energy and potential energy. Uh, anything that is changing height based on gravity will have the same exchange between kinetic energy and potential energy. Right. The classic example is if you throw something up in the air, you know, at the bottom it has a bunch of kinetic energy, at the top it has zero kinetic energy, but then now it has more potential energy. And then as it falls, it loses potential energy and gains kinetic energy. Gains, gains speed, right? And the same thing is true for someone who's swinging on a swing, that there will be the same speeds and the same amounts of energy, or as, uh, you know, a bike going up and down a hill, or a roller coaster. Yeah, so if you just know how to do your kinetic and potential energy, just from the height of each point on a roller coaster track, you can figure out how fast it's going to be going at those points. Um, and so the, what, we, what we care about here is saying, OK, if I have a certain amount of kinetic energy at the bottom of the loop, how much do I have at the top? If I know the speed at the bottom of the loop and the height of the loop, what's going to be the speed at the top of the loop? How much of the speed at the bottom do I lose to potential energy as I make it to the top? And you know, there's some equation you can do. The kinetic energy at the bottom is one half mv squared at the bottom. The kinetic energy at the top is one half mv squared at the top. Uh, the amount of potential energy that you need to go up a certain height h is mgh. And the energy throughout this whole thing is the same. So what that means is that one half mv squared at the top plus mgh, which is the total energy at the top, is the same as one half mv squared at the bottom, which is the total energy at the bottom. So at the bottom, you just have one half mv squared at the bottom. At the top, you have mgh and one half mv squared is smaller than the feet. And it's all the same amount of energy. Uh, and if you solve this for the speed at the bottom, you get this equation. So the speed at the top squared plus 2gh is the speed at the bottom. So if you, if you start out at the bottom with this much speed and you're going to go up h, you're going to lose this much speed and end up with that much speed. Does that make sense? And again, obviously you don't, you know, you don't have to actually go use these equations, but if you want to go play with this yourself, that's how you do it. So, there, so there's two sets of equations that we need to understand the loop. And that's one of them. And the other one is really easy, is circular motion. The other one is the relationship between how fast you're going and how tight you're turning and how many Gs you're feeling. Right? And that's true for airplanes making turns and cars and racetrack and planets and satellites and you know, anything that, that's going around in the circle, uh, the number of Gs that it's experiencing, or the number of Gs necessary to pull it into that type of turn are the square of the speed divided by the radius, right? So anything, you know, if you're, if you're taking an exit off the highway, if you increase your speed by two, the number of Gs that you'll experience goes up by four, right? And the same thing for, for an airplane. Uh, you know, if, uh, if a blackbird is flying at three times the speed of sound, and it can only take three Gs, then the radius of turn is going to be a whole lot of miles, right? You can go play this quickly. And it'll tell you, based on just the number of Gs and how fast you're going, what the radius is, or given to you, kind of through. Uh, and there's different forms of this equation, but I think this one's the easiest one. So the, the Gs are the speed squared divided by the radius. Um, all right. So can an airplane do a loop? How many Gs do you need? How fast do you need to go? So th there's basically three ways. To, if you want to set up a physics problem and do some math, uh, there's basically three ways to do it. And I'll, I'll go through the three ways. I'll, I'm, I'm only going to really do the third way. The, other, the first two, I'm just going to show you ways so that you could do this. Uh, the first way to model a loop, and a lot of people do this in physics class in high school, is pretend it's a circle. Now, loops aren't circles. If you've been noticing out there, loops are generally uh, teardrops. But let's pretend it's a circle. And some aerobatic pilots, if they pull a lot of Gs and they go into aerobatic competition, they try and make as, as close to a perfect circular loop as they can. So this is not totally useless. Uh, but you'll see. So, so how do I model a circular loop? I go over here and I say, oh, one half is the bottom squared. You know, this is what I just told you about kinetic energy and potential energy. 
Uh, that means that by, by sweep at the bottom, that's going to be half the square of the top plus two times uh, twice the radius of the loop, right? So the height of the loop is, is twice the radius of the loop. And then I go, okay, in order to not fall off the top, the, the acceleration of the top has to be 1g, right? If the airplane going over the top is feeling 1g, then that 1g is applied by gravity and you're actually feeling weightless. So you're feeling, you know, you start pulling G's at the bottom, and you feel less G's, less G's, less G's, less G's, and at the top you're weightless for just a moment, and then you come around the, the backside. So that's the, you know, if you're, if you're barely able to do a loop, the, the, the bare minimum loop is where you have a moment of weightlessness at the bottom. If you, if you come in any slower than that, or pull, pull any fewer G's than that, you're not going to make all of that, right? Um, okay, so if the G's at the top are zero, and we know what the speed at the top is from our kinetic energy, energy equations, you plug some stuff in, and what you get at the end is that the speed at the bottom squared divided by the radius, so the number of g's you're pulling, is 5g, just the same the loop, uh, plus gravity, so you don't fall down, right? So you have 5g's worth of centrifugal acceleration just from going around the loop, and because you're at the bottom, you also have the limit from, from gravity. So that, that adds up to 6g. So long story short, if you want to do a perfectly circular loop, you need to be pulling 6g at the bottom. And that's the only requirement. If you can do 6G at the bottom, you can do a perfectly circular loop. Uh, if you cannot do 6G at the bottom, well, you can still do a teardrop, and we'll get to that. But in order to do, uh, do a perfectly circular loop, you know, the question can, can an airplane do a perfectly circular loop? You know, the answer is well, if you pull 6G, you can. And if you can't pull 6G, you can't. Uh, and that's really the end. You know, and a funny aside, this is the exact same physics that's going around the swing, right? People say, well, how fast do you have to go at the bottom of the swing to swing all the way around the top of the swing? Well, you have to be going fast enough to pull 6G. If you're going any slower than 6G at the bottom of the swing, then before you get to the top of the swing, the chain's going to collapse, right? But if you're pulling 6G around the bottom of the swing, the chain's going to stay taut all the way around. It's the exact same for the All right, so that's circular loops. That's not really useful for us here competition air back out. You know, what, what about us? I mean, we have airplanes that can only go three or four or five G's. Uh, Alright, so the second approach to following a loop is saying, well, what if, what if the number of G's is constant? What if the number of G's is changing? You know, if you, if you do some, uh, some math, you can figure out that as you go up and up and up the loop, you need to turn your G's because you're slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, uh, and you have less and less speed to work with. And so what you can do is just look into the math of, you know, the math of curves where the radius of the curve changes steadily, or the g's of the curve changes steadily. And there are things called Cornu spirals and clothoids that have these, these equations in there. Uh, they're very complicated differential equations. These are not high school level equations, so I'm not going to get into them. You usually have to be in college studying engineering to, to solve these kinds of differential equations. These were invented uh, by railroad engineers in the, in the like, mid-1800s, right? So in the mid-1800s, you have trains going fast enough that the trains have to make turns, and if you, if you have it going from a straight line to another straight line, if you just have a circle, right, the train will be going along, and then as soon as it hits a circle, boom, a certain number of Gs, and as soon as you hit the straight line, boom, you know, zero, you know, or back to the original, uh, you, what you want is a smooth transition from a straight line into a gradually tightening turn, and then a gradually untightening turn, right? And highway on-ramps and off-ramps use these equations, right? Because as you go into the, the off-ramp, you know, you don't want to do this, and then you do the off-ramp, and then you have to go in a straight line. No, you want to have to, Turn your steering wheel gradually, so your turn gradually tightens, and then you know at some point you start unturning your steering wheel, and your, your turn radius gradually untightens. Uh, so these are the equations for that, but they're too ugly, and I'm, you know if you want to go have fun and play with these, you can, but I'm not going to do that today. What I am going to do is say what's a better way to do it is to do a discretizing, is to take a loop and split it into many little segments, and each little segment can be just a circle. So you have, a, you know, the, the segments near the bottom are going to be wide circles with big radiuses, and the segments near the top are going to be tighter circles. And so I'm kind of gradually transitioning from big circles to little circles, and then back to big circles. And that means that each segment of the loop, I can analyze using just this equation and this equation, right? Each segment of the loop can just be a circular loop. Uh, but I can still get a pretty good idea of, as the airplane slows down, how the circle changes. And you know, this, to, to generalize, this is called a numerical analysis, right? You've heard people talk about numerical analysis. This is uh, one of the ways to, this is kind of one of the kinds of things that they need. And, and just philosophically, it, it's worthwhile pausing for a second and saying, you know, numerical analyses have their problems, and it, some people don't really trust them, and why not? So let, let me address that for a second. So a lot of problems, a lot of physics problems, you know, kind of structures engineers, 
here. So a problem like, uh, what's the stress of processes as you then, right, something like that. Now that problem has an exact solution or closed form solution. Right? The exact solution or closed form solution is an equation that tells you exactly what the stress is at each point of it. Right? Just like these equations tell you exactly how many Gs you're pulling and what your local radius is as you transition from the term or the loop or whatever. Um, so that's an exact solution. But usually the math is really, really up. You need college level differential equation kind of math to play with a lot of exact solutions. And the miracle analysis, you know, we've got a set here. Well, I think going to the salt. As the airplane gets slower and slower and slower, 
at some point you hit maneuver speed, right? And maneuver speed is a speed that if you're any slower than that, you can't pull the maximum G's with the air in the court, you can slow. Right? Maneuver speed, if you're going faster than maneuver speed, and you pull as many G's as you can, the wings break off, right? If you're going slower than maneuver speed, and you pull as many G's as you can, the air stalls. So if you're going below maneuver speed, you actually can't pull three G's or whatever it is the airplane can take anymore. Right? So as you get below maneuver speed, I actually have a, the, the G's here, as they, they check to see if the speed is below the maneuver speed. And, and the maneuver speed is the stall speed times the square root of how many G's you want to pull. Right? Because that pressure is proportional to the square, and I'm not going to go into it. But my point is, as you get slower and slower and slower, the number of G's you can pull uh, decreases once you're below maneuver speed. So I need to know what the stall speed is. Uh, so anyway, so I get a curve, and, and so trying, I try this with a whole bunch of different numbers, lots of different speeds and the number of G's and the salt speeds. What, what, what if the airplane has a really low salt speed and a really fast maximum speed? What if the maximum speed is very close to salt speed? I try all kinds of combinations, and this is the result. Uh, so as a function of how many G's you can pull, and the ratio between the maximum speed and the salt speed. So imagine the ratio, for example, between V and E and VS1 for an airplane. Uh, so, what, and, and so if you're in the red zone, you can't do a loop. If you're in the red zone, you basically run out of airspeed before you get to 90 degrees. If you're in the orange uh, line, the orange line is basically a tail slide. So if you're in the orange line, you run out of airspeed just as you get to 90 degrees. And if you're a pair over that, you're going to fall back and do a backflip. And that's what I consider to be the bare minimum thing that kind of counts as a loop. Um, and if you're out to the green zone, you can, you can have speed all the way around. You're not going to run out of speed. And if you're in the blue zone, you actually stay above maneuver speed the whole way. So if you're in the blue zone, you can you actually pull the maximum maneuver G's all the way around. Uh, so what that means is if your airplane can go, you know, if, if the maximum speed of the airplane is five times the stall speed, which for some airplanes is actually about what it is, you can do a loop pulling less than two G's. You're going to slow down a heck of a lot, but that's okay if you're not going to stall. But if your airplane, if your if your uh, maneuver, if your uh, maximum speed is only two or three times your stall speed, then yeah, you really need to be pulling two or three G's to make sure you don't stall or don't fall off the top. Uh, which I think is bad uh, and, and so I, I looked up a bunch of airplanes and looked up their VMEs and their VS1s just to see what that ratio is for most reasonable airplanes. Like R6, Cirrus, Bonanza, Piper Cub, 172, Lancer 4, one of the LSAs, and a Learjet. And here's the ratio between their minimum speed and their maximum speed. Um, and so, so most airplanes are, are right on there, and so most airplanes could do a loop if you do it just right. I guess got some pirate going on. Uh, one thing that I thought was really interesting is that, you know, one kind of airplane that sees a really big spread between their maximum speed and their minimum speed is business jets. Because business jets are supposed to operate from relatively small airports, but they're supposed to cruise at almost airliner speed. Right? So if anyone has a little stream I can borrow, go try to see if I can do a loop with it. You know. uh, so yeah, so most airplanes can do a loop, but but they say, well, most airplanes can do a loop if you do it perfectly, right? Doing it perfectly means that you're pulling the maximum number of G's that the structure can take all the way up until maneuver speed. Then when you get to maneuver speed, you're on the verge of the stall, when right? you're, you're at that critical angle of attack where you're starting to feel the, 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 the stall, you know, vibrations all the way around the top, and then you start picking a suit again. And as soon as you have maneuver speed, you're going to be pulling exactly the maximum number of G's the airplane can take. So if you do that exactly, you can loop most airplanes. If you cannot do that exactly, and you mess up somewhere along the way, then that's not going to be So what's your, what's your margin? How, how much can I mess up and still do a loop, right? So in a sense, the orange line is the, you know, if I can do it perfectly, and then the more, the higher up you go from the orange line, let's say you can mess up by give or take one G, that gives you that orange line. If you mess up by give or take two Gs, that gives you the green line. Mess, to be able to mess it up give or take three Gs, that's the blue line. So basically, the, the, the higher up on the graph you are, the worst the job you can do flying the airplane is still loop it around without breaking anything, right? Which is why aerobatic airplanes are all, all the way up there, right? If you have a, you know, a Pitts or a, or a Zipco or even, a, even an RV, that means you can, you know, you don't have to do just right. You can go all the way around and pull that number of Gs, give or take, and still, still be fine. Uh, all right, so in summary, the higher the ratio between the maximum speed and the minimum speed, so for example, the higher the ratio between V and E and VS1, the fewer G's you need to go all the way around. Uh, and the ability to pull more G's mostly just makes it safer. It means you can do a, a less perfect job pulling just the right number of G's and still make it around safely. Uh, and like I saw earlier, it means your, your loops can be more, more circular. You can pull more G's. Uh, 
So that's really the end of the, of the, of the meat of the presentation. There's just other topics that I could kind of bring up. So for example, an implement in a split S are you know, half a loop and you know, half a little here, half a little here. So pretty much the same math applies. And the Q8 is also just a combination of pieces of loops and pieces of rolls, as you know. Um, so one way to think about it, but the main difference is that um, at the top of, a, of an implement, you don't have to be able to just barely use your G. You have to be going fast enough to be able to roll the air and invert it and fly off. So the, the speed requirements at the top of the element is a little bit faster. So you need to start off going a little bit faster. You need more speed at the bottom, so you have more speed at the top. Um, and the same thing for the split S. So at the beginning of the split S, you're going to very slowly on the vertical stall, but it's that, that's actually more speed than you have at the top of the normal. So to be able to do the moment in a split S, I'm just going to take that graph that you saw earlier, and it basically shifted, you know, by one that way, right? You, you need to, at the top of the loop, you don't have to have zero, you have to have stall speed. So the whole time, you need an additional stall speed worth of speed to be able to, you know, to do that. So if your airplane can't fly two or three times, it's, you know, it's stall speed, then it, uh, or, or if, if your v &E is lower than two or three times your stall speed, then you can't do it in a moment, or a split S, because you'll overspeed the airplane at the bottom. Um, and another thing that, that so some people say, oh, okay, so could a 737, 747 move? Um, you know, an airplane, so it's an airplane move really fast, like an airliner move really fast, um, but it only pulls two and a half Gs. And the problem with that is that if, once you, you're going really fast and you pull a relatively small number of Gs, you're going to go up like miles, right? You're going to go up like five or 10,000 feet if you try to do a loop an airplane way that fast. And if you see, you know, like an F-22 with Blue Angel or something, they end up way over there. Um, and the atmosphere starts getting thinner, right? And your stall speed goes up. So you, you lose the capability of pulling as many Gs as you do low over the ground once you go way, way up there. And so when people ask me, they put an airline in the loop, I, what I actually did is I repaid that spreadsheet, but the stall speed changes as a function of altitude. So as you go higher and higher and higher, the ability to pull Gs goes down and down. Um, and, you know, long story short, I made a spreadsheet that takes the evidence into account, and I was able to just barely get an airliner to do a loop if you, if you do just right. If you start off at the maximum speed that you can safely fly the airliner, and then you pull just under the maximum amount of Gs that the structure can take, and then once you hit maneuver speed, you're on the verge of the stall all the way around the top, and there's barely the maximum number of Gs, then you could loop an airliner if you're, you know, if you're perfect. You know, pra practical terms, it wouldn't be safe. But, if you, but physically, it's, it's barely physically possible. So, I, yeah, uh, I think that's in meters, so that's two miles. So that's uh, 10,000 feet. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm from Brazil originally. So I learned Newtonian physics with meters and newtons uh, and things like that. So all the units in these, in these uh, spreadsheets are really fine. Yeah, so that's, that's the end of the, the core of the, the presentation. You could mention other things. For example, could the airplane do a slow roll? Although what you're really asking is, can the airplane fly knife edge? And can the airplane fly with sustained negative energy? Right? Can the airplane fly a sustained inverted flight? Uh, how do you think about sustained inverted flight? What does it take for an airplane to fly sustained inverted flights? Many guys may know from, you know, if you guys have RPs or ECs or other kind of aerobatic airplanes like that, there's three things you need to be able to fly sustained inverted flight. Uh, you need structural strength, right? The, the wings, spars, and things have to be strong enough to take more than minus one G. Your, your systems need to be able to take sustained inverted flight, so you need to have inverted oil and fuel, right? So instead of having just one fuel and take up the bottom of the tank, you have a flop and two of those. Uh, and then the third thing, which is a little trickier, is uh, elevator authority. If you don't have enough elevator authority, you, you won't be able to push hard enough to nose the airplane up and keep it uh, inverted. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, remember how most airplanes, the center of gravity is out of the way. airplanes to fly uh, in a balanced way, they have a downwards force on the tail, right? So, that, so a balanced airplane, you have a downwards force on the tail, downwards force from gravity, and the lift is somewhere in the middle. Uh, and what that means, if you took a normal airplane and just flipped it upside down, it'll, you know, it'll go downwards, obviously. Um, but if you took an airplane and flipped it upside down and just gave it enough angle, angle of attack so that the wing is generating lift, that actually won't work either, because if you just flip the airplane upside down, now both the wing and the tail would be pushing upwards, and the airplane would, you know, the nose would come down, and it would go into a nose dive. But if you flip the airplane upside down, and you have the tail making downwards force, right, so basically you flip the airplane upside down and you push, 
so that the tail is deflecting air upwards and pushing itself downwards, right? From your point of view, you're trying to push the nose above the horizon, right? If you can do that enough, the airplane will sustain the vertical flight. But that requires a certain amount of elevator authority, right? If your elevator looks like this, you probably aren't going to be able to sustain the vertical flight. But if your elevator looks like that, you probably will, right? So it depends on, you know, what fraction of your horizontal stabilizer is, is elevator area, right? Is movable area. Uh, and, and by how much does it move, right? If your elevator is just a little tiny little tap in the back and it moves a little bit, like you have an air poop, you know, you're not going to be able to sustain a vertical flight unless you're going really fast. And, and that's the other parameter of this too. The faster you go, the less elevator deflection you need to sustain a vertical flight. Uh, so if you get an airplane going really fast, this will be easier to move. Anyway, so I'm not going to go into the equations or, or drawing graphs or anything, but that, you know, if you want to ask, hmm, could I sustain a vertical flight in a given airplane, these are the parameters you're going to have to measure. And then knife edge flight is kind of the same idea, right? The fuselage has some, some center of lift somewhere. Uh, the rudder is going to be trying to kick the tail upwards, right? If you're flying sideways like this, right? Air is hitting that vertical stabilizer. Air is trying to lift the tail up and bring the nose down. So the rudder has to kick upwards. Uh, and you basically have to rudder the airplane, you know, rudder the nose above the horizon. And if you have enough rudder for you can do it. And if you don't, you can't. That's kind of, kind of what it comes down to is how big is your rudder and how much you can move it. And yeah, that's the end of the presentation. I'll just scratch the surface, right? There's all kinds of things we can talk about if we want to sharpen our pencil and do more analysis, right? We didn't talk about spins or hammerheads or snap rolls or various other things. Um, people always ask me this. I'm surprised that no one's asked me this yet. Um, when I say that kinetic energy turns into potential energy as you go on the loop, I assumed that thrust equals drag, right? I assumed that as you go up and up and up, the only thing that's causing you to lose speed is, is gravity. Uh, but in reality, that's not true. In reality, if you start off at some speed level flight, as you get slower and slower and slower, you have less and less drag, but you have more and more thrust. So actually, that will help you a little bit. Um, unless you're in an underpowered airplane, like a Citabria or, or something like that, uh, where you need to dive to pick up speed. So even all the way at the bottom of the loop, your thrust is not matching your drag anymore. So you're slowing down all the way to the end. And then how many Gs you pull at each moment will impact your induced drag and how much, how much speed you're losing. So I just kind of assumed that thrust is equal drag, but in reality, thrust is not equal drag. And so if you redo this analysis, taking that into account, it's much more complicated. And you know, if you redo this analysis with an F-22 or with a Citabra, you can get very different answers. Uh, but that's another big, that would be kind of the next most important parameter that I would analyze. Um, and then, you know, there's all kinds of other maneuvers, there's launch box and hub mold, and you're seeing that out there. You know, what about formation? Uh, what if you have uh, airplanes that are barely stable or unstable that kind of snap themselves around? Uh, they can get all kinds of crazy high angles of attack. Like they have post solid capability, basically. Uh, so in, the, in, the, in my analysis, I said, oh, if you go below a certain speed, you stall. If you go above a certain angle of attack, you stall. Um, you know, it's not that simple for a lot of airplanes. Um, what if you have thrust spec training? What if you have control surfaces and prop washers? All kinds of things that would help you do more than what I'm saying here. But this is a, a kind of the bare bones way to start thinking about it. So that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts or anything? Yes? So this is interesting that there's some basic data that I have on the uh -huh. and it's never been spun. Okay, uh -huh. so I'm afraid. Uh-huh. I'm afraid of spins too. One of the reasons why I didn't talk about spins is that spins are very complicated. Spins depend on not just where your center of gravity is relative to the you know, wings of the tail, but also on the moment of pressure of the airplane. Right? If I have weight that's, that's closer to the, the tips of the airplane versus weight closer to the middle, I get different spin characteristics. Right? If you have a, an RV and your battery is between the rudder pedals or in the tail cone, you're going to get different answers. If you have uh, lights and cameras and these people have pyro and whatever out near the wingtips, you're going to get a different answer. So, so two airplanes that may look very similar might actually spin quite differently because the stuff inside is in different places. Um, and yeah, so, so and I'm afraid of spins too. The main thing that, that determines whether or not you can get out of a spin, and again, this is oversimplifying a lot, is the error of your, of your vertical stabilizer. And you notice, for example, how the early RVs are also the small vertical stabilizers. Uh, and part of the reason why they went to the bigger vertical stabilizer than the 78 is to make them easier to get out of the spin. So I've been told, you know, don't spin your RV6. And then one instructor told me, oh yeah, you can spin your RV6. How will we do we get out of it? And he was an experienced aerobatic pilot, so I went up with him and I spun the RV6. And we slowly got it to slow down and got out of the spin. Yeah, yeah I don't want to do this again. Uh, but yeah, but, so, so that's very complicated. And, I, and, and here's the thing too. Um, 
big airplane companies have thousands of engineers and a lot of computing power and some computational tools that are much more advanced than this, right? So, so they have whole departments of people that will tell them exactly how the airplane is going to fly. Do this, don't do this. Or during testing, try this, but when you do, do it this way, right? And you guys don't have that, right? If you, if you build an easy or an RV at home or if you design something, uh, you don't have thousands of engineers and lots and lots of fancy math and software that will tell you exactly what's going to happen. So in a way, that's kind of what I was doing here. But even these companies with thousands of engineers and advanced computational uh, you know, resources um, will sometimes get the spins wrong, right? Like F-18 has spun to the ground, Global Hawks has spun to the ground, like very modern airplanes that cost billions of dollars to develop have spun to the ground. Yeah, so I'm afraid it's just really bad what I, what, I would, uh, what it comes down to. So if you have an airplane that's very similar to, you know, if it's the same model as the airplanes that other people have spun, and you can go fly with the instructor who's an experienced doing aerobatics in the airplane, they'll say, oh, well, you spin it, make sure you don't get past the spinning turns or whatever, then you, know, then you can try it. If you have an experienced person that says it's okay as long as X, Y, and Z, but other than that, yeah, they won't try it. Yes? Yeah so, so, yeah, so both the loop and the roll of this analysis, you basically enter them as fast as you're willing to go. So theoretically, that could be VNE, uh, but in practice, at the end of the maneuver, you might be going downhill maybe a little longer than you expected, and you might end up the maneuver going a little bit faster than you were at the beginning, so you probably want to back off from VNE a little bit. Uh, so yeah, so basically as fast as you're, you feel safe going is the, the bottom line here. Um, in reality, you don't need to go that fast, but in reality, you know, so in the RV, I've had entry goals at, you know, 130-ish, yeah, that's plenty. It's going to say, at, at, you're not going to make the top of the loop. Yeah, the faster you go in, the more likely you're in. So, ratio of, of your same, so speed. Yeah, well, it depends on how many Gs you want to pull, right? So that's what the graph is. So let's say you're willing to pull 3G in whatever airplane it is. If you're willing to pull 3G, then you really need to go in at, you know, say if you're only going to pull 3D, you really need to go in at, I don't know, 1.7-ish your stall speed. If you're only going to pull 3G and you go in at less than 1.7 times your stall speed, you're going to be in red. Right? But if you're only going to pull 3G and you come in at twice your stall speed, now you're in green. Right? So as a function of how many Gs you're going to pull, this is how fast you have to be going in terms of how many times your stall speed. Yes? Oh, you're, you, either your airplane manufacturer does, or you go, well, in, in practice, in flight testing home built, what you're really supposed to do is take it up to some high-ish speed, and if you're building a home build, there are others out there of, you know, there's advice out there on what that speed would be. Uh, if it's your own design, then you have to do aeroelastic analysis, which is not very straightforward, but it can be done. Um, and what, what that does is that's the you go up there, fly to speed, and you fly it as you know, faster than I think I'll ever fly it, and then you, um, you know, you move the controls, you, you quickly say deflect your arm, heel and then you pulse the controls. You pulse the elements, or you pulse the elevators, and you, to, see, to make sure that the airplane doesn't start fluttering. If, you, if the airplane does not flutter at a certain speed, then you're okay to fly that speed, you know, that, that high speed. And then usually the VND is minus 15% from whatever the fastest speed is that the airplane is testing. Right, so, you tend, so usually when you're developing an airliner, you fly it up to, fly up to the speed of sound, maybe a little bit more this, you know, not quite a little bit sound. Let's say one one or one point nine nine. Say okay, that means that up to point eight five eight six seven. We know it's not going to flutter. Right? So uh, and, and again, that's because big airplane manufacturers have engineers running you know fancy software. But um, yeah, I'm trying to you know could you do aeroelastic analysis by yourself? I think it would be very hard to do. You can pick up a book on aeroelastics, and what the book will tell you is that any B has a resonant frequency, right? Any beam, if you pick it, you know, if it's mounted to the wall and you bend it and you let it go, it's going to go boom, right? And the frequency at which it does that has to do with the mass of the beam and with the rigidity of the beam, uh, and, and really not much else. So, so given a wing, which has a certain known mass and a certain known rigidity, you know, if you do your structural analysis, you can figure out what that resonant frequency would be. And the faster you fly, the more energy you have to fly You know, you, 
pretty much have to look at other airplanes out there to know that, well, if I go a little pretty much like this, I should be able to take it, you know, your tail fins and so on. I should be able to take it to a certain number of miles per hour and it will flutter. Uh, so your fan your fan is just a function of your, your flutter speed. How you interpret your flutter speed is some combination of analysis. Asymmetric genes, what do you mean? Well, when you're in a roll. Uh -huh. Fair planes, you know, you think about positive or negative genes, uh -huh. but in a roll, you get an asymmetric gene uh -huh. going in both rolls like a barrel roll. Right. And airplanes usually have a much lower asymmetric gene limit than you do. Right. Yeah, so I was talking about a zero G in a roll. All you do is pull the airplane up, and then in a zero G, well, this is free fall, you roll the airplane, and once it swings up like it, you pull the airplane up. That's true. Yeah, so I did talk about a barrel roll. For a barrel roll, not only do you have to deal with the SMF you also have to ask yourself, do I have my height? Am I fast enough? You're basically doing a roll and a loop at the same time. So you have to do all of, all of that analysis at the same time. So I didn't get into that. But you can set, set up the problem pretty much the same way, except, yeah, like I said, now it's a two dimensional problem. It's this way and this way. And yeah, so, so I didn't get into that, but you can set up the analysis the same way. Any other questions? I apologize for the airplane noise. And again, that's what we all came here for. Uh, oh yeah. So all this, all this stuff, and all the other slides that I teach, and I keep adding them on more over time as I do things, are at understandingairplanes.com. So that's my website. You can email me from there if you want. Uh, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks for coming.